We're doing it from home again uh, this week, but it's not because of COVID. It's actually because of the weather. So it is, uh, the roads are uh, snow packed and icy and the wind chills are uh, very uh, low. So uh, anyway, here we are at home again, but I hope you're able to join us. We are in a series uh, that we began last week, A Perfect God Uses Imperfect People, and we're doing, uh, starting out with a character study of Elijah. So last week, uh, when in, in our introduction to Elijah in Scripture is uh, 1 Kings 17. We studied that last week, and we will be studying 1 Kings 18 today. So if you want to get your Bible or your device and um, turn to 1 Kings chapter 18, that's where we'll be studying today. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be with us, that your word would find a way to teach us and lodge in our hearts, and Lord, that uh, you will just help us to be who you want us to be, Father. Bless your word as it goes out. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, when we left off at the end of chapter 17, uh, Elijah was in Zarephath. If you will remember, uh, Zarephath was near the... What? Ouch. Oh. I'm supposed to have it on. Well, excuse me. Okay, is that all right? Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, so Zarephat, at the end of chapter 17 last week in 1 Kings, uh, Elijah was there. And remember, we thought it a little bit odd because in the New Testament we read where there were lots of widows in Israel, but God sent uh, Elijah to Zarephath, which was the um, called the Baal seat. It was a city uh, not only steeped in idolatry, but it was the the center of uh of, I, of uh, Baal worship. So that's where he's at. He's lodging with a widow and her son there. So uh, verse 18, that or chapter 18, I'm sorry, of 1 Kings is where we're going to begin now. And we will be uh, studying this chapter today. I'm sorry, I'm distracted because I'm trying to find out if, if you can hear me or not. Okay. So, said you can, so here we go. Chapter 18 of 1 Kings. It says, later on, in the third year of the drought, the Lord said to Elijah, Go present yourself to King Ahab. Tell him I will soon send rain. So Elijah went to be appear before Ahab. Meanwhile, the famine had become very severe in Samaria, so Ahab summoned Obadiah, who was in charge of the palace. Obadiah was a devoted follower of the Lord, but he was not the author of the minor prophet book of Obadiah. This is a different Obadiah, but uh, he was over in charge of the palace that King Ahab and Jezebel lived in, which uh, being a devout follower of the Lord would have probably been a difficult place for him to work and being. But verse 4 says, once when Jezebel had tried to kill all of the Lord's prophets because she's a Baal worshiper and she uh, put out a an order to kill all of the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had hidden a hundred of them in two caves. He put 50 prophets in each cave and supplied them with food and water. And if this happened during that famine, that would have, it would have been a big chore feeding a hundred men all day, uh, every day. But if it was during uh, the famine, it would have been super hard, but he did it. Obadiah did it. Ahab said to Obadiah, we must check every spring and valley in the land to see if we can find enough grass to save at least some of my horses and mules. So they divided the land between them. Ahab went one way by himself and Obadiah went the other way by himself. I will give this to King Ahab. He seems always to be out and about. And I don't know if it's because he likes the outdoors or he doesn't like being home with Jezebel, but he is out and about. 
Verse 7 says, as Obadiah was walking along, he suddenly saw Elijah coming toward him. Obadiah recognized him at once and bowed low to the ground before him. Is it really you, my Lord Elijah? He asked. Yes, it is, Elijah replied. Now go and tell your master Elijah is here. Sounds simple enough, but listen to verse 9. Oh, sir, Obadiah protested. What harm have I done you that you're sending me to my death at the hands of Ahab? For I swear by the Lord your God, it's his God too, that the king has searched every nation and kingdom on earth from end to end to find you. Aha! Remember where God put Elijah? Probably the one place that uh, they that uh, Ahab and Jezebel would not think to look for him, but in a pagan city, Zarephath, where it was known as the seat of Baal. It was the hub of Baal worship, and Elijah had been there. Well, Ahab would never think of looking for him there, and you know how we say, how the scripture tells us that God goes before us, he comes after us, and he walks beside us. Well, he had been gone before uh, Elijah, and he knew that uh, Ahab was going to be looking for him everywhere. He said uh, every nation and kingdom on earth from end to end to find you. So God put Elijah in a place he knew he would be safe. He went before him. He knew what was coming. And that's why he was where he was. And each time he he was told, Elijah isn't here, King Ahab forced the king of that nation to swear to the truth of his claim. He wasn't taking their word for it. Verse 11, And now you say, go tell your master Elijah's here. But as soon as I leave you, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you away who knows where. And Ahab, when Ahab comes and cannot find you, he'll kill me. Yet, I have been a true servant of the Lord all my life. So evidently he was uh, from a child, had, had served the Lord. Verse 13 says, Has no one ever told you, my Lord, about the time when Jezebel was trying to kill the Lord's prophets? I hid a hundred of them in two caves and supplied them with food and water. So he said, you know, this isn't the first time that I have taken a risk or that I have taken a chance. But now you say, verse 14, go tell your master Elijah is here. Sir, if I do that, Ahab will certainly kill me. But Elijah said, I swear by the Lord Almighty in whose presence I stand that I will present myself to Ahab this very day. He said, the Lord's not going to whisk me off. I'm going to be here. Go tell Ahab. So Obadiah trusted God's ability to handle the physical and spiritual situation in Israel. And And I wondered when I read all of this, you know, Obadiah trusted the ability of God to handle the situation in Israel. And folks, I'm telling you, we're living in a time when you and I just need to trust the Lord our God and his ability to handle the uh, physical and spiritual and political situation in our nation. God is in control of it all. And Obadiah trusted him. And I want to challenge you and myself today. When we hear of things, uh, evil things that are happening in our world, that we just trust our God as Obadiah did and know that he has the ability and is in control of all things and he can handle the situation that we are in. So we have no need to fear and we need to experience that peace that he gives to us. So Obadiah, verse 16, went to tell Ahab and Eli- that Elijah had come, and Ahab went out to meet Elijah, and when Ahab saw him, he exclaimed, So, is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? Well, Ahab and his uh, his father, Omri, were the uh, real reason for the trouble in Israel, and Elijah told him so in verse 18. He said, I've made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers. Why? 
for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal instead. So Israel's real problem was a spiritual problem. And my friend, today, the world's real problem is a spiritual problem. America's real problem is a spiritual problem. It's not a political problem. It's a spiritual problem, just as it was here. Verse 19, Elijah said, Now summon all Israel to join me at Mount Carmel, along with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, who are supported by Jezebel. So Jezebel is supporting, supplying food and water and everything that they need. She is supporting 450 Baal prophets. That is the, uh, Baal is a, is a male god, and uh, Asherah is his female counterpart, and she is supporting 400 of, uh, of those uh, prophets. So verse 20 tells us, so Ahab summons all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. Okay, Mount, the Phoenicians considered Mount Carmel as the sacred dwelling place of Baal. God is meeting Baal, this false god, on his own turf. But Ahab and all of um, Baal's prophets would have thought, Yes, this is a perfect place for because that is the dwelling place of Baal. He will be there and he will answer our prayers. So I think they were probably more than happy to meet him on that mountain. But did you see who all was invited? Uh, Ahab's supposed to be there. The Baal prophets are supposed to be there. Verse 20 says, and all the people of Israel invite them to come. So folks, there were hundreds, if not thousands of people going up to Mount Carmel that day. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. He told the people, it's the people that were invited. And that's the reason all of this even took place, folks. It was for the people. It wasn't to teach Baal a lesson. It was to teach the people a lesson. We'll see that in just a moment. But he said, you know, you waver between the true and living God and Baal. If, if the living God doesn't do it for you, then ask Baal, maybe he will. If Baal doesn't come through, then ask God, and maybe he will. And they were just going back and forth between two opinions and trying to pray to and serve both gods. But Elijah said, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But make a decision. But it says the people were completely silent. 22. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left. Now, that wasn't true, but it was the way he felt. But he is the only one up on Mount Carmel. But Baal has 450 prophets. So he said, here I am, just me. And Baal has 450 prophets. He said, now bring two bulls. The prophets of Baal may choose whichever one they wish and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood of their altar, but without setting fire to it. They are, Baal's prophets really think that he is handing them a deal because Baal is the god of the sun, the god of lightning, the god of fire. And it's in his dwelling place. It's looking good for him. So they think. He said, I will prepare the other bull, lay it on the wood of the altar, but not set fire to it. Then call on the name of your God, and I'll call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. So all the people agreed. Verse 25, then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, you go first, uh, for there are many of you. 
choose one of the bulls and prepare it and call on the name of your God, but do not set fire to the wood. Verse 26, so they prepared one of the bulls and placed it on the altar. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime, shouting, O Baal, answer us. But there was no reply of any kind. There wasn't a voice. There wasn't a sound. There wasn't thunder. There wasn't uh, a reply of any kind. It was, except for the noise they were making, the heavens were quiet. There wasn't a reply of any kind. Of course there wasn't, because Baal is a false god. But they didn't believe that. Then they danced, hobbling around the altar they had made. But listen to this, verse 27. About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. He said, maybe you need to shout louder. Uh, for surely he is a god, but Elijah knows he isn't. But he's taunting them. He said, perhaps he's daydreaming or is relieving himself. Maybe he's gone potty. Or maybe he's away on a trip. Or maybe he's just asleep and needs to be awakened. Verse 28 says, so they shouted louder. They did exactly what Elijah said. He said, maybe you need to shout louder. So they shouted louder, following their normal custom. Their normal custom. They cut themselves with knives and swords until the blood gushed out. I want to just take a second here and anybody who may be listening to this and you cut yourself, that is pagan. It's um, demonic and self-mutilation always comes from the evil one. So if, if you are addicted to that, please get help and stop. It is not from the Lord. The Lord never asks for self-mutilation. Never. So break away from that. Seek help. Because it's demonic. And you want to stop. And I pray that if anybody's listening that does that, that this will be your first step in seeking help and stopping because that was their normal custom. Verse 29, they, they uh, raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice, but there was still no sound, no reply, no response. Verse 30 says, then Elijah called to the people, come over here. Okay, enough's enough. Come over here now. They all crowded around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down there. Evidently was an old altar that had been built to the Lord and it was in disrepair. So he repaired it. He took 12 stones, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel. And he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench. Now, this isn't part of it. He doesn't have to do this. But he dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about three gallons. He piled wood on the altar, cut the bull into pieces, and laid the pieces on the wood. Then he said, fill four large jars with water and pour the water over the offering and the wood. Have you ever tried to start a fire with wood that is wet? It's not happening. Then, then, after they had done that, you know, and you say, wow, there was a drought. Where in the world did they get that water? That's what I wondered anyway. But remember when uh, Ahab told Obadiah to go look for springs? So I'm going with the fact that there was a spring nearby, and that's where they got the water. Because if that's not the case, the Mediterranean Sea it's right there, it's within vision, but going back and forth would sure take a long time, but there was plenty of water there. So, uh, like I said, I'm gonna go with the spring, because, uh, but I really don't know which one is right, but they got the water 
even though there hadn't been any rain in three years. So after they'd done this, he said, do the same thing again. So they poured four large jars of water on it. Then they poured four more. And when they had finished, he said, do it a third time. So they poured four more. So they did as he said, and the water ran around the altar and even filled the trench. Okay, that's why he built the trench. He knew what he was going to do. 36. At the usual time of offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed. He didn't do any dancing around. He didn't do any shouting. He walked up to the altar and he prayed. O oh, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all of this at your command. O oh Lord, answer me, answer me, listen, so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. So you see, all this is going on is for the people so that they will be brought back to God and not trying to worship God and worship Baal, but to realize that Baal has no power and that God is God and to serve him. That's the reason for the whole thing. God drawing people back to himself. Verse 38, immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull in the wood, the stones and the dust. Listen, it burned up the bull. It burned up the wood. It burned up the stones and the dust, it even licked up all the water in the trench. That was some fire. 39, and when all the people saw it, they fell down on the ground and cried out, the Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. We would have too if we'd been there, wouldn't we? Because God did what Elijah asked him to. He proved to the people that he is God, the only God not just the superior God. He is the only God. Verse 40 says, Then Elijah commanded, Seize all the prophets of Baal. Don't let a single one escape. Remember when Jezebel was going to kill all of God's prophets? Do you know in Scripture where God says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay? He said, don't let a single one escape. So the people seized them all, and Elijah took them down to the Kishron Valley and killed them there, all 450 of them, and maybe the 400 too. I, I'm not going to put them in there because it doesn't actually mention them, but I'm going to guess it was all of them. But we'll, uh... okay. Then verse 41, then Elijah said to Ahab, go get something to eat and drink for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Listen, there's not a cloud in the sky, none. There's no thunder. But Elijah's relationship with the Lord determined what he heard. And sometimes our relationship with the Lord determines what we hear. Verse 42 says, so it amazes me that the prophets do what Elijah tells them to. Ahab does what Elijah tells him to. He said, go get something to eat or drink. So 42 says, oh, Abraham, or uh, Ahab, excuse me, not Abraham, Ahab. Verse 42 says, I'm trying to talk fast because this is a long chapter and I'm trying to get it in a short time and sometimes my brain doesn't keep up with my mouth, so... Verse 42, so Ahab went to eat and drink, just like Elijah told him to, but Elijah climbed back. He told Ahab to start down. He climbed back up to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. He found a place to be alone with God and he prayed. Then he said to his servant, go and look out 
toward the sea. You know, prayer activates God's will. That's why we need to pray. That's why God wants us to pray. But it said, the servant went and looked. Then he returned to Elijah and said, I don't see anything. Elijah prayed, but nothing happened. Ever been there? Seven times Elijah told him to go and look. The number seven in scripture is known as... Uh, is the uh, number of completion. If you go to Genesis, um, in the beginning of the book of Genesis, you'll find that God created the earth and all that is in it in six days and rested on what? The seventh day, the day of completion. If you go to Revelation, you find at the end of the book that it talks about, uh, Genesis is talking about creating the world and seven years of tribulation in the book of Revelation talks about God's judgment of the world. But again, seven years, the number of completion. So seven times Elijah told him to go out and look. And finally, the seventh time the servant told him, I saw a little tiny cloud about the size of a man's hand rising out of the sea. It wasn't very big but it was just a little bitty cloud coming up out of the sea. Then Elijah shouted, hurry to Ahab and tell him, climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. Mount Carmel is, uh, it has peaks and valleys. It's not all just one big mountain. It, it has peaks and valleys. So it had to have been at least 15 miles and probably could not have been more than 25 from wh where they were to Jezreel. 45, and soon the sky was black with clouds. A heavy wind brought a terrible rainstorm and Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. Listen to this, it's so... Uh, it, it, it'll make you smile. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt. You know, he brought the, the back of his cloak up and tucked it so it makes it kind of like pants so that it doesn't uh, drag on the ground and slow him down. And the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt and ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. He outran a chariot. It was at least 15 miles. Could have been up to 25. And God gave him the strength. I think his legs must have... Well, they were definitely flying because he outran horses, at least a horse. But he ran ahead of them on foot. You know, I kind of hope maybe that there's something like theaters in heaven. And tonight's main feature is uh, Elijah on Mount Carmel. So we can actually see some of this stuff. I hope, I'd love for it, for God to be taping some of it for us so that we can see it when we get there because I think this would be so fun to watch, don't you? Well, his legs were surely churning as he outran that chariot. But folks, as we look at this, we see that Baal has been discredited for sure. But Jezebel would be humiliated. You know what that means? Next week, she is coming after him. But you know, you may think, well, that's what God did to draw people back to himself back then. But he's done something even more miraculous, folks, for us today. When Jesus died on the cross that Friday, there was a great earthquake uh, there was total darkness for three hours in the middle of the day. 
a great veil was torn from the top to the bottom, which would have been impossible for any human to have done. There were so many phenomenons going on when Jesus was on the cross. So God has done miraculous things. And if, if you've not read that, you need to read it about what all happened when Jesus was hanging on that cross. But my friend, they took his body down, they buried it. And on the third day, he rose again. And he is our God. He is in control of everything. He is the one who gives us peace. He is the one who gives us power. He is the one who gives us wisdom. Oh, my friend, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you need to ask him into your heart today. Right now, just say, I'm a sinner. Please come into my heart. Take away my sin and make me your child. And he said, anybody that will ask, he said, I, if anybody will open the door, he said, I'll come in. Doesn't make any difference who you are, what you've done. Makes absolutely no difference. If anybody asks the Lord to come in, he said, I will come in. So ask him into your heart so you can experience that peace and joy and all those things that, that he gives uh, to his children. And I pray that God will bless you and that, my friend, one of these days, I want to stroll over heaven with you some glad day when all our troubles and heartaches have truly vanished away. We'll enjoy all the beauty where all things are new. I want to stroll over heaven with you. Thank you.